Welcome to Still Pretty, a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast from Chipperish Media. I'm film scholar and locker monster, Noelle LaCroix. And I'm story expert and stinky, sulfur-smelling scapula, Lonnie Diane Rich. And we are here today to talk about I Only Have Eyes for You, the 19th episode of season two. I Only Have Eyes for You aired on April 28th, 1998, and was written by Marty fucking Knox and my right. friend and yours, <laughs> and directed by James Whitmore Jr. Yes, every episode of Still Pretty is fully spoiled because we talk about Buffy all the way through. We might even bring in stuff from Angel the series. You don't know what we're going to do. We're unpredictable. So I just want to let you know if you haven't been spoiled, go ahead and watch the whole thing and then come back to Still Pretty. It'll totally be worth it. All right. We're going to look at all the pieces carefully and rationally, and we're going to keep looking until we know exactly how this is all your fault. So let's go on patrol. And I only have eyes for you. Buffy interrupts a boy arguing with his girlfriend because she broke up with him, shouting at her that love is forever. Buffy knocks the gun out of his hand just as he's about to shoot, but when the boy and girl snap out of it and have no memory of what happened or why, Buffy suspects things are starting to get a little weird. We weren't even fighting a few minutes ago. We weren't. I I swear to God. If you weren't fighting, then why'd you have a gun? I I don't know. I don't even know where I got it. I don't see any gun. When Buffy is in Principal Snyder's office, a yearbook from 1955 falls off the shelf and she puts it back. Later in class, she falls asleep from boredom and sees a vision of a student and teacher from the past flirting, then wakes up to her teacher writing, Don't walk away from me, bitch, on the chalkboard. When a disembodied ghostly arm grabs Xander at his locker, the Scoobies get to Scoobying, trying to figure out who the ghost is and what they want. Later that night, a janitor and a teacher who don't seem to know each other well have the same argument, but Giles is too late to stop it before the gun goes off. What's going on? What's going on? You just shot a woman. In their new multi-million dollar and conveniently abandoned cement mansion, Angelus flirts with Drew mostly to piss off Spike, but Drew has a vision of the Slayer in trouble. Giles is convinced that the ghost is Jenny, despite the fact that none of the specifics of the murder match what happened with her. Buffy, Willow, and Xander find the yearbook and discover that a teacher named Grace broke up with a student named James the night of the Sadie Hawkins dance in 1955. James shot and killed Grace, then killed himself, and his ghost is reliving the event. We need to shut him down before some other innocent guy goes and kills some poor nice girl and then blows his brains out all over the music room wall. Willow makes a plan to do a magical exorcism, creating a triangle around the site of the murder so that they can banish James's ghost. At the school, Buffy sees the ghosts of Grace and James dancing in the music room to I Only Have Eyes for You, and it's all sweet until James's face decomposes. Cordelia's face becomes scarred in the bathroom, and Willow is almost swallowed by the floor in the school lobby. Buffy relives the events of Grace and James' romance, and James's decomposed face yells at her. Giles rescues Willow from the lobby floor and accepts that the ghost is not Jenny. The clock strikes midnight and the four Scoobies start the ritual to expel James from the school. The ritual fails spectacularly as a horde of wasps attacks and chases them out and forms a wall around the school. The Scoobies reconvene at Buffy's house and figure out that James wants forgiveness, but can't get it. And like Giles, Buffy sees the whole thing through one very personal and increasingly less subtextual lens. James destroyed the one person he loves the most in a moment of blind passion. That's not something you forgive. Unable to talk about this anymore, Buffy leaves the house and goes back to school by herself. As she approaches, the wall of wasps opens to let her pass. Willow figures out where Buffy went, but the wall of wasps won't let them all back in. It does, however, let Angelus in, and after a few moments of dark taunting, both Buffy and Angelus are under the spell playing out the gender-swapped roles of James and Grace, ending with Buffy as James, shooting Angel as Grace. Don't talk to me like I'm so stupid! Angel falls over the balcony, as Grace did, and Buffy heads into the music room with the gun to shoot herself, as James did. Angel, however, being a vampire, is able to wake up and find her before she can kill herself, and they play out the rest of the story with Grace offering James forgiveness. They kiss, the souls of James and Grace leave, and then... Angel. 
Back at the library, Giles talks to Buffy about her experience, and she tries to figure out why Grace would forgive James. Giles says it doesn't really matter, and Buffy accepts that. At the mansion, Angel is trying to wash off the love that violated him, and he and Drew decide to go out and get in a nice, vile kill before dawn. As they leave Spike behind, Spike rises from his wheelchair, fully restored, but biding his time to get back at Angel. All right, so, Noelle, I only have eyes for you. Honestly, this is one of my favorite episodes of the run of Buffy so far, um, and definitely, I think, a high point of season two. But don't let my love for it influence you. (laughs) What is your opinion? What do you think? This is one of the episodes that I completely forgot about until (laughs) I watched it again, and then... Oh my god! I mean, I think this is my favorite episode so far. Yeah, it's so good. I, but I have to tell you, my first thought about we were about maybe three quarters of the way through the episode, and I went, "Oh shit, Lonnie's gonna have a field day, right?" Because themes. Oh my god, <laughs> themes. Yeah, that whole forgiveness thing is a little bit rough. Um, And uh, we will address all of that in just a little bit. Uh, But I don't want to get too ranty right off the top of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's fair. (laughs) So let's go ahead and start talking about um, Buffy's guilt and grief. Um, I kind of love the way they track this through Angel and Buffy. Um, Even though the specifics of the two situations don't quite match up, it allows Buffy to finally get some closure, not just about what happened with Angel, but about her role in it and and the way that she Mm -hmm. blames herself, which is something that we haven't seen come to the surface until this very specific monster shows up. And this is where the monster metaphor is so incredibly powerful. When a monster means more than just a monster, um, it can do such incredible things for the characters and how they move through the story world. And I absolutely loved it, you know, and I love that the only way to stop this cycle is for Angel as Grace to be able to live through the attack And stop James from shooting himself and offer him Mm -hmm. that forgiveness, which I think is just an incredible way to kind of play this out. Um, I love Buffy's disgust with James and the way that that tracks with her self-blame for letting this happen to Angel, that she feels it's her fault, you know, Mm -hmm. because she broke him with her vagina, which, of course, is, you know... (laughs) Is 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 it like it, you do? It's that vic- like you do, right? It's that victim blaming that you know that I I can't really be on board with, but I can absolutely be on board with Buffy feeling that way because I think yes. it's something that probably consciously she hasn't really worked through, but she has felt like she did something that essentially killed Angel. Yeah, and and brought all of the rest of this down because yeah. Jenny is dead because of Mm angelus and everything has shifted in the scooby's world and she's just you know she's taking it all upon herself and i i love i love her dismissive anger Mm -hmm. with james i mean immediately she's like and and even before that yeah the boy in the hallway yeah i First of all, I love that young couple. I love the yeah. performance mm-hmm. on both of their parts. I was, I mean, I'm like, like I said, I didn't remember this episode until yeah. I was in it. And then I was mm-hmm. like, oh, holy crap. Like, right. it's gonna, this is, wow. Um, <laughs> but when she's, you know, he's like, the the guy's like, I don't know why I did that. And Buffy says, because you're a jerk. Yes. Like, mm-hmm. she's just not, she has no time for anyone's excuses or yeah you know the paranormal is not even has not even crossed her radar yet she's just like you're awful yeah you were about to shoot your girlfriend Mm -hmm. what the actual fuck exactly (laughs) yeah and i mean when they have that moment and they both wake up and they're like i have no idea what just happened you know and then the janitor is like well where's the gun and i thought it was a great way of bringing the janitor 
in there too. Yes. You know, because we yeah. have him and we see him there and he's sort of, you know, and then when the janitor ends up getting pulled into it later, um, it's not like just two people out of nowhere, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. it actually was was really interesting. And so I mm-hmm. liked the way that they did that. Um, she has absolutely no sympathy for James. Buffy has no sympathy for James in the beginning. Um, and she says, you know, she has that whole thing. James destroyed the one person he loved the most in a moment of blind passion. Mm-hmm. That's when it all becomes like textual. That's when it comes to the surface, I think, for Buffy. Up until then, you know, she's just, she's slamming herself a couple of times. She's like, you know, I slept with him. He lost his soul. Now my boyfriend's gone forever. And the demon that wears his face is killing my friends, you know, um, which is, which is a really <laughs> you know? powerful yeah. experience, you know, for her to, to have. Um, and then when he's talking, when she's talking about Giles, you know, wanting this to be Jenny, you know, she says he misses her. He can't think just a little more fallout from my love life. So yeah. she is really carrying the weight of, you know, not just Angelus and what he's done, you know, mm-hmm. um, but also that she feels like she killed him, you know, yeah. like, how can you, how can you be forgiven for killing the person that you love most in the world? And of course, none of that is her fault, you know, yeah, but she, but she feels fe- that mm-hmm. she feels like it's her fault because she made the choice. She made the active choice to have sex with Angel. Yeah. Um, in that something I love about that scene between the two of them, mm-hmm. um, actually, is that she is she's she is the one making the decision. Yeah. In that moment. So when all of this goes horribly, horribly wrong. Yeah. It, I mean. Obviously, it's not her fault. It's not right. her fault. And I completely see why she would feel that way because yeah. she was the one who said, just kiss me. Right. And then everything goes, you know, yeah. everything goes south from there, so right. to speak. Right. Um, but we open, I mean, we open this episode at the bronze mm-hmm. with Buffy rejecting Ben yeah. Sweet, sweet Ben. Sweet, sweet ben. From Algebra 2. Yes. <laughs> like, who, I mean, shout out to Ben from Algebra 2. He handles that really well. He I mean, does. Buffy's being, Buffy's being quite dramatic with her. I'm never dating ever again, ever, not even a little bit. Exactly. Um, but of course, you know, I can totally understand where she's coming from mm-hmm. with the, I made an active choice to be with this person. Yeah. To have sex with him. And now... Right. My friends are dying. And now my friends are dying. You know, but there's not just the sense of responsibility for, you know, like for Jenny and for the other people that Angelus mm-hmm. is killing. He also killed Teresa, you know, a classmate from mm-hmm. an episode a couple of episodes ago. Um, but it's also that, you know, she feels responsible for what happened to Angel. You know, that Angel has died because of her, you know, and now there's this monster that's wearing his face going around and hurting her friends. So there's all this stuff, but there's also this sense that you like, you know, and I will tell you, you know, from personal experience that I I very much identify over identify much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I very much identify (laughs) with this because when the person that you loved reveals themselves not to be real. You know, and that Mm -hmm. they are actually a monster and they're out hurting people, you know, not just Mm -hmm. you, but like other people as well. You don't know. I, you know, you feel responsible for the terrible things that he does, but also you feel like you don't have a right to mourn the person you loved. You know, for whatever, because that person is gone and now there's this monster there. So you have to go through this grief process, but you don't feel allowed to have that grief process. And that does like the the sublimation of grief that you feel that is genuine, but you don't feel you have a right to feel it, you know, creates a lot of anger, you know, creates a lot of that, that sense of, and I can see her absolutely taking that out on, you know, on James and feeling, directing that anger over this grief that she doesn't allow herself to feel that she doesn't feel she has a right to feel, but which is also at the same time, very real, you know, Um, I can see that absolutely coming out at, at James. And I think that is such a, such a complicated and and really accurate to the experience portrayal um Mm -hmm. the nuance there is so interesting to me and um and just really really well done there's a lot of layers of things going on here with Buffy that I think are just fantastic yeah it's fantastically written fantastically performed I love that Buffy in order to 
continue to function Mm -hmm. really yeah goes to goes to the space of anger Mm -hmm. instead of feeling her grief yeah Mm -hmm. i mean whereas giles is trying so hard to grapple Mm -hmm. with this grief over jenny and really like (laughs) poor giles yes Poor Giles. My heart just breaks for Giles I in this know, episode. I know. It's so sad. And he's so like, you know, for a while there, he's like out. Like he's he's on the bench. Yeah. He can't function. You know, he can't be a part <laughs> yeah. of the team here um, because he's not he's not addressing the reality that is. He's he's kind of trying to make it into the reality he wants, which is I think not that Jenny would, you know, cause people to to hurt other people you know um but that jenny would be accessible somehow you know that she was she was present she was there and so he just wanted so desperately for her to be there and i think that that is a really cool thing too you know yeah so one of my favorite bits of giles's process Mm -hmm. in this episode is when he comes to visit willow Mm -hmm. in jenny's classroom yeah and Willow is killing it. She's Willow's doing such amazing. A, she's doing so beautifully mm-hmm. and she's in her element and she tells him, you know, she left great lesson plans like I'm just I'm just following yeah. what she left for me and they have this sweet moment where they're talking about you know, they're talking about the lesson plans and Jenny's dedication and, mm-hmm. you know, her computer, you know, everything that was on her computer, including her pagan and magic sites and yeah. files. And I'm so delighted to see Willow. I know. Willow's delight at that. But there, I love that they're having this conversation that's really about how wonderful Jenny was and yeah. how much they miss her mm-hmm. and but they're not they're they're talking about lesson plans yeah. and it's just oh it's so it's so so good and Giles just kind of you can see him just kind of wanting to be there mm-hmm. in Jenny's yeah. classroom with yeah. her things and her you know and he's <laughs> <laughs> and he never he never wanted anything to do with all these computers. I right. Mean, <laughs> it's like <laughs> non smelly, you know, yes, whatever. Yes, non tactile. Yeah. Oh, oh, and I just got it. Mm-hmm. So computers aren't smelly, yeah. but magic is. Magic is because smelly. Magic is smelly. Uh-huh. Oh, because later on. Willow is stinky and Giles is like, good job using sulfur. <laughs> yes, I know. And I love the way that I love Willow picking up on this new passion, you know, mm-hmm. that she, it's something she's so excited about. And of course, then mm-hmm. they immediately go into doing that spell, which I think is incredible. You know, the whole spell thing is very fun <laughs> with them all in those different spaces saying the words, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really. And of course, the spell doesn't work. You know, it's not effective. It basically is effective at really pissing off James to the point where he generates wasps, you know. Right. Um, to protect the building. Um, but I love that she she comes in and finds a magical solution. And this, of course, is the beginning of our evolution of Willow as a witch. You know, yeah. this is the beginning. Like, she gets that. That is something that she picks up from Jenny Calendar and carries mm-hmm. with her. And it becomes a powerful part of her identity for the rest of the show. Yeah. You know, and I, mean, I think and, that that's so cool. Yeah. And she literally picks up something of Jenny's. She yeah. she picks up the rose quartz yeah. and hands it to Giles. And it's this lovely, like, passing of the torch almost mm-hmm. that Jenny was our Jenny was our techno pagan. Yeah. And now we've got Willow who's going to bring magic and, you know, that kind of healing mm-hmm. to the group. And I just I oh, I love it. It. It's so good. Yeah. Yep. It it gets me. It's so good. It gets you (laughs) right there. It gets me right there. Well, and Willow, Willow and Giles, we've talked before Mm -hmm. about Willow and Giles and their relationship and how complex it is, really. Mm -hmm. And I think it's I I don't want to dive too deep into this with this episode, but I think there's something interesting and noteworthy. In the fact that in the past, we have a student-teacher relationship that mm-hmm. is obviously romantic. Yes. And in the present, we have this student-teacher relationship that is 
not at all romantic that could no. easily be you know somebody who didn't know might say willow and the librarians spend a lot of time together <laughs> but you know but and there isn't any sense there's of, nothing there's nothing there there's nothing and even in the moment when he rescues her from being swallowed mm-hmm. up by the floor right and mm-hmm. they tumble down the stairs you know in this sort of prone position right yeah. you know yeah. and the kind of thing that like whenever that happens with a man and a woman we always have that shot of one of them on top of the other and then that awkward thing and there was and none then of that, that with her oh. thank god <laughs> yeah. thank god if they Some had done flustered thank god i would be horrified but i do love though that the relationship between willow and giles has always been like giles and buffy are very much a father daughter you know analog um and that is so clear there is absolutely parent child thing going on there with Mm -hmm. willow though it is always felt more like colleagues yes and um and she is Almost at his level, just in, you know, in intellect, in knowledge, in enthusiasm for knowledge, like all Mm -hmm. of that stuff. And so she is, you know, connected with him. And of course, it is him saving Willow from this floor swallowing monster thing you <laughs> yeah know? um and uh, and himself saving Willow that wakes him up from this idea that it was Jenny you know that he's like no yeah. I, I, I and Willow says Jenny would never be so mean I and love the way Giles she says like, that no. and as soon as she says yeah. that he wakes up and so they have this sort of relationship of I mean not quite equals because there is a power differential there there is an age mm-hmm. differential there so I mean that is acknowledged but they really are much more colleagues and, yeah, it's and that like a mentor mentee relationship. Yeah, yeah that's how I read love. it. I love. I love yeah. it. Um, it's yeah. such a great and special relationship between the two of them, and seeing that play out as the thing that wakes up Giles, um, yeah. I think is is really, honestly, one of my favorite things in this episode. Which has, oh, I have a lot of things to love in this episode, but one of the things I don't love. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> let's go uh, yeah. ahead and do this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> let's <laughs> really do it because oh um, god. Giles and this idea of forgiveness, right? There is this thing that we do culturally where we idolize the idea of forgiveness, that somebody who's had something terrible done to them, you know, it's almost an expectation that they should be the ones to rise above it and to forgive. and, And that makes you a better person. And that somehow if you can't forgive that that makes you a worse person or a lesser person. And and I addressed this once um, <laughs> on an episode of a podcast called Big Strong Yes that I did with Dr. Kelly Jones, who is my co-host over on the Angel uh, podcast, Still Dead, um, and uh, had a little discussion. And so what I'm going to do rather than rehash that whole thing now is just play a clip of it for you guys to listen to. And then Noelle and I'll hop back in. <laughs> Um, but you know, I mean, we were talking about this whole, like, you know, forgiveness thing and that I couldn't forgive myself. So of course I couldn't forgive him. And then, you know, uh, over on the discord channel, people have been like, oh my God, like it is rumbling with it. Like everybody is processing the idea of forgiveness and we're all talking Mm -hmm. about it from these different perspectives. And it truly is like this group rumble where everybody's like, well, Mm -hmm. but here's the thing about forgiveness and why should you have to forgive somebody? And then, you know, you forgive them and they're what off the hook, they're absolved. And it's this whole big thing, you know? Um, So it's, it's been really interesting. I don't want to share anything, you know, from the discord chat because that's, that's kind of a a very private and sort of like a really sacred space right now. Um, But one of the things that we were, talking about is that we were looking for another word for the concept of of releasing the anger and resentment without it having you know bugger all to do with the perpetrator because you know fuck him you know like um so i don't know my nomination was the unfucking you know that like you (laughs) you unburden yourself of all the bullshit that they did to you and that you don't have to forgive them the anger yes absolutely is bad for you and and um the resentment and holding on to all of those bad feelings yeah you know that's that's bad for you and you should absolutely release that you know but to forgive someone who isn't sorry who continues the behavior that hurt you in the first place no 
Like I have forgiven people. I know that I can forgive people because I do it all the time. And anybody who has ever been actually sorry and has stopped, you know, the behavior that was hurting me, that was fine. I've forgotten it. Like, you know, forgive and forget, boom, done. Like life is too Mm -hmm. short to hold on to that stuff. But I don't see why my ability to move on with my life is now dependent on me forgiving this asshole. You know, like, why is that a thing that I have to do? What do I owe him? Nothing. I don't owe him forgiveness, you know? And so on page 150, Brene Brown says, I wasn't surprised to find a growing number of empirical studies showing that forgiveness positively correlates with emotional, mental, and physical well-being. And I would argue that correlation is not causation. Forgiveness allows you to release what happened and move on, but it is not the only path to releasing what happened and moving on. You do not have to forgive anybody and then she goes into this thing from archbishop tutu where and i mean you know i have tons of respect for archbishop tutu and all of the tutus and i love saying tutu so i'm going to talk about him as much as humanly possible (laughs) but he says remaining in that state locks you in a state of victimhood making you almost dependent on the perpetrator but i would argue that telling a victim that they have to forgive their perpetrator is actually what does that. It's putting the weight of everything on the victim. It's now the victim's job to unfuck everything and forgive that asshole? No. And then later on page 152, he even says, you can even help the perpetrator to become a better person too. Well, you know what? Not my fucking job, Tutu. I am not here to make him a better person. That's his goddamn job. And whether he does it or not has nothing to do with whether or not I'm going to get over this or I'm going to heal from this. You know, you go fix what you've done. You fix what's wrong with you and you get absolution from yourself. I'm not giving it to you, you know, but this idea that that I have to forgive them in order for me to be able to move on, um, you know, that I found completely infuriating. And you know what? I think I'm right. And, you know, yes. I completely realize that the very fact that I prefer the unfucking to, oh, release it and let it go and move on, you know, in this nice <laughs> language shows that I'm obviously still very angry about this issue. I am still having very strong feelings about this thing and that maybe my perspective on it might be somewhat clouded by my passions in this moment. All right, fine. Rome wasn't built in a fucking day. But what I'm saying <laughs> is that I have the ability to unfuck my life from what they've done to me with without having to say, no, no, that's okay. I forgive you. Yeah. And I would say that was a mic drop, except please don't drop mics. They're expensive. Exactly. It's technology. Don't don't hurt the technology. Okay. So I would say that was, that rant went out um, (laughs) well over a year ago when we did that. That episode was probably around, I don't know, September or October-ish, maybe. um, Oh, I think it was before then. Maybe before that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But uh, so it's, it's been a little while and I've had (laughs) a little time and I have since processed a little bit more. And I will tell you right now that I still feel very strongly that I was right about that, that it is is not you you need to for you find a way to unfuck your life absolutely Mm -hmm. but it is not your job to forgive other people especially people who are not sorry now i think in the in this instance with james he is reliving this stuff he may not even be aware that he's making people kill each other you know from his perspective he's probably just Mm -hmm. reliving it and reliving it and reliving that trauma you know and that's Mm -hmm. kind of a different thing um but i think that you know he probably like as we see when we go through to the end of that um of that cycle you know once angel is able to get up from where you know grace had been killed and come Mm -hmm. in and forgive you know, um, that, uh, that, that, you know, allows him to release. And he's obviously very clearly sorry for what he's done, you know, with James. Yeah. Um, but I, but this idea, Giles says forgiveness is an act of compassion. It's not done because people deserve it. It's because they need it. And that's not at all what forgiveness uh, is for, you yeah. know, forgiveness is so that, Forgiveness is basically a selfish act and it should be a selfish act. It isn't about others. It's about the person doing the forgiving. And more importantly, especially in this circumstance with Buffy is it's an act of self-compassion, you know, Mm -hmm. because she needs to be able to forgive herself, which she is completely unable to do. And Mm -hmm. I think that this idea that forgiveness somehow 
takes the the uh, weight and the responsibility off of the perpetrator and puts it onto the victim. That's what pisses me off about this idea. You know, yeah. that it's this act of compassion that you are somehow, um, you know, under some kind of obligation to perform um, when you've when you've been victimized. And I don't think that that is is necessarily the way it should be. So I don't know, a year I and, mean, and some odd later, Noel, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, this is such a it's such a tricky situation. I mean, I'll, I'm going to start with the episode because I have thoughts. <laughs> I have yes. many thoughts and feelings about forgiveness. Um, in general, yeah. Mm -hmm. In general. In this episode, the the crucial piece, the missing piece in the whole James Grace murder suicide scenario is that him firing the gun is an accident. He does oh. not... He does not mean to shoot her in that mm -hmm. moment. He's waving the gun at her because he's, you know, he's angry. Oh, so you don't think he deliberately pulled that trigger? I think he deliberately, I mean, he deliberately brought a gun well, to yeah. this breakup conversation. Yeah. Um, but no, my understanding of that moment, my reading of that moment is that he never, he didn't mean to shoot her in that mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. That the gun goes off. Because he's so angry, he yeah. has, he's waving the gun at her, and then it he fires. It fires. Yeah. That's my read, that he never, you know, in that moment. Okay, this is going to... Yeah, that's I'm not my read a, of it. But <laughs> Okay. All right. I'm going to put... But you're very generous. <laughs> I'm going to put a big old trigger warning on this mm -hmm. for suicide. Yeah. Um, so everybody, I mean... It's a real thing. It's a real issue. Feel free to skip ahead about, I'm going to say five minutes because I'm going to go off on this. Okay. But mm -hmm. Here we go. There is a documentary about mm -hmm. the Golden Gate Bridge called The Bridge. Yeah. Um, that is about jumpers. People who, you know, go there with the express purpose of killing themselves. And the... It's a it's a fantastic documentary. If it's something that you feel if it's a subject matter that you feel like you can engage with safely, mm -hmm. I really, really encourage um, people to watch this. There's one particular interview with a young man who survived his suicide mm -hmm. attempt where he talks about because the bridge is so high, you have time on wow. your way down mm -hmm. from the bridge to the water to think about what you've just done. Oh my God. Right? I know. And he says that in that moment, he realized that he didn't want to die Ugh. in that fall as he was falling toward the water. And he was oh able God. to, you know, f whatever combination of uh, luck or uh, coincidence or divine mm -hmm. intervention or whatever you happen to believe, he was able to angle his body in such a way and he made mm -hmm. it, you know. He he made it, but mm -hmm. he does that that moment for me was just so, so chilling because I have been in that space yeah. of wanting to end everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I had some intuitive sense that I would that I would also have that moment mm -hmm. of no, this is not really what I don't really want to die. Mm -hmm. I really want to be somewhere else or you know i want something yeah. to change and i feel powerless to change it so mm -hmm. um so with james and the, i i read that sort of headspace into james and the gun that he yeah. brings the gun to this confrontation not because he actually wants to kill grace or kill himself but because he's he wants he needs a way out. He needs a way to have some power in a situation where he feels completely powerless. Yeah. And I mean, you've talked before about guns as unearned power. I mean, mm -hmm. I think he takes he takes this, you know, symbol of power and dominance and and violence and control. Mm -hmm. But that's not really what he wants. He never he doesn't really want to hurt her. He is a he's not really angry with her. He's sad. He's yeah. heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And I have issues with that just from a narrative perspective. The idea, and we see this a lot in fiction, that the the mad guy mm -hmm. is actually the sad guy. And therefore, yeah. what he does is not really his fault, which 
No. I mean, Mm -hmm. yeah, but it's, I mean, it's such a complex situation for Mm -hmm. me with James and the gun and then what he feels like he has to do because he's made this horrible, fatal mistake Mm -hmm. of shooting someone that he never really wanted to hurt. Mm -hmm. So that's my read. That is, that's my read of that moment. So the, the forgiveness for him is not about, you know, it's, it's not about, it's not your fault. It's about, I know that you didn't mean to do what you did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I read that completely differently. Like I, I see James as one of these people and we see this actually represented a lot in, in fiction, this entitlement, you know, of Mm -hmm. men to women. And it's not saying that women don't do this kind of thing too. You know, women Mm -hmm. have, killed people in jealous rages before that has absolutely mm-hmm. happened. Um, but the story that we get a lot is this this sense of of male entitlement to women and to women's bodies and to women's lives. If I can't mm-hmm. have you, nobody can, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think that he went in there, he went, he got a gun, you mm-hmm. know, he went there to um, to argue with her and tell her that she couldn't break up with him, which of course she could because she has that right, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, And it is one thing for him to go there without a gun and say, this isn't what I wanted to have happen, you know, um, that and to express how he was feeling about the breakup with her, I think is okay. But the don't walk away from me, bitch, like that right there. No, that's not okay. The and the shooting the gun, I don't believe for a moment that was an accident. I think that he absolutely in that moment intended to do it. I think he immediately regretted it and was obviously Mm -hmm. clearly in shock about it after Mm -hmm. the moment had happened. Um, But I think that he absolutely meant to if I can't have you, you can't live. Like, I am Mm -hmm. not going to allow you to live. I am going to take the power in this situation. So James, I think, is a very, um, very complicated and, you know, and very um, destructive person, you know. Um, And so I see this as he needs forgiveness for something that he absolutely did do deliberately. And Mm -hmm. I think that that's and he needs to forgive himself. Now, with Buffy's analog with this. Mm-hmm. She holds herself responsible in the same way that James would rightly hold himself responsible. But Buffy is not responsible. She had no idea that any of these things would lead to where they led. Whereas James holding a gun can probably, you know, suss it out oh, like, yeah. where that's yeah. where that situation is going. Buffy simply had sex with the man she loved, which is not something mm-hmm. that you can blame her for. Um, she can blame herself. And I understand that. Um, but I think that James needed to forgive himself. And that's a situation where I don't think that if you've done something terrible um, that until you cannot be forgiven no matter who forgives you even if Grace forgave James right Mm -hmm. it's James forgiving himself that he needs to do Um, and I think it's and and the thing is is that you cannot be totally forgiven until you've forgiven yourself and you cannot forgive yourself until you are truly sorry you know I went off in that rant about people who aren't sorry you know, being mm-hmm. somehow like entitled to this compassion and this forgiveness from me um, or from any victim, you know, um, and that's and that's not really what it is, because even if I forgive somebody who doesn't deserve it and doesn't want it and isn't sorry and thinks that they had the right to do everything that they did, um, it doesn't matter because it doesn't affect them at all. You know, Mm -hmm. like unless unless I decide to forgive them to the point where I give them another shot at me, which has traditionally been the way I've done things in the past. Um, So I think that like for this, James needed to forgive himself and Buffy needed to forgive herself. Um, But it was it was Grace and it was Angel who made that possible, you know, who made that forgiveness possible by opening up that space with their own forgiveness, you know? Mm -hmm. And of course it wasn't, you know, it was Angelus who was, uh, you know, possessed by grace, you know, (laughs) so you can say it wasn't really Angel who was saying, you know, you didn't kill me. It's not your fault. 
you know, and, and I, I love you and I, I loved you yeah. always and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the analog there doesn't quite line up perfectly, but I, I kind of like that it doesn't line up perfectly. Um, I think that it's, it's nice to have that dissonance there between the two situations because while James and Grace can finally have the closure that they clearly need, you know, or that mm-hmm. James clearly needed, um, Buffy and Angel can't have that closure because yeah. because the situation is ongoing um and because it is not angelus who is sorry for anything you know mm-hmm. um he's having a great time he loves it um yes so it's it's all <laughs> very complicated but i think that this idea this cultural idea this this you know glorified weight that we put on forgiveness is misplaced and, and actively damaging Mm -hmm. um to to victims i do think that there is a point where you need to like i said you know unfuck your life and if you can forgive people that is a great way of like releasing it but it's not an act of compassion outward it's an act of compassion inward and i think that that's where it needs to be focused that the the person who hurt you the person who did these terrible things they don't matter they don't matter you know you matter and if you can't move on until you've forgiven them then you need to do that for you so giles whole bit about it's not done because people deserve it it's done because they need it it has absolutely nothing to do with whether they need it or deserve it that doesn't matter you know it's it's about it's about the person who needs to do the forgiving and i really kind of wish i think that this this episode would be perfect if that's what giles had said you know, mm. forgiveness is something that, um, you know, that that people need to do for themselves. You know, that James needs to forgive himself. And Buffy being unable to forgive herself to go into that school with this, you know, in this possessed place where it really is about James forgiving himself for what he did on purpose and Buffy forgiving herself for what she didn't do on purpose and she had no idea. You Mm -hmm. know, Buffy doesn't hold any fault there and James does. And I kind of like that dissonance um, because it opens up a really complicated and interesting place to have this discussion about forgiveness. Um, But yeah, you know, your response to this episode, Lonnie's going to lose it, you know, was was entirely on board because I still, I I still feel that same way. You know, my opinions on this have, have not, changed at all yeah and I I mean I have a lot of thoughts about forgiveness Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) and I think that I mean I I completely agree with you that forgiveness is and really has to be I think very situation specific Mm -hmm. because forgiveness doesn't really work for me and I Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I think and I think part of the reason for that is that it doesn't get to the heart of what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, it, like people do horrible things. People do yes. horrible things all the time. Mm-hmm. And we can understand, you know, we can say, oh, you're just a jerk. You know, like Buffy mm-hmm. does in the beginning. Yeah, you did this because you're a horrible person. And we can also say, well, wait a minute. Like the the horrible person mm-hmm. has their own, you know, there's a reason that someone behaves that way. There's a reason that, you know, we can have compassion for yeah. someone's, you know, horrible Well, some people childhood. are just assholes. Some well, people are true. just terrible fucking people. I mean, it, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, some people, because they choose to be, I mean, this, and this is where I'm getting, be. like, yeah. some be, like we can have, I can have compassion for somebody's terrible childhood, or I can have mm-hmm. compassion for somebody's terrible experience that, you know, makes, makes them so angry or so um, hurt or whatever that they have to put that hurt on someone yeah. else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That doesn't make it okay. It right. doesn't mm-hmm. make it, that doesn't mean, oh, it's fine. You yeah. know, James is sad. So he shoots this woman that he supposedly loves and, it's okay because he got his feelings hurt. No, that's not, you know, that's not it at all, but we can have, it's not so much about forgiveness as it is about compassion and understanding. Mm -hmm. And also that is not okay. It's not at the same time holding them responsible for what they did. Yes. But having that compassion, you know, um, absolutely. I think that there's a space for that. Yeah. And it doesn't mean, and having compassion for someone doesn't mean that you allow them to continue to hurt you having yeah. compassion mm-hmm. you know oh he didn't mean it it was an accident 
Mm-hmm. That doesn't make it okay. Right. Um, so, and that doesn't mean ugh. that you let that person take another shot at you. Like that's, right. that's another thing too, is that we have this thing where like, you know, you need to forgive and you need to be able to forgive and then, and then move on and whatever. And, and move you know, on. And yeah. in situations where what somebody did was, you know, shitty, but not terrible. Like, mm-hmm. absolutely. Like, yeah, you, you know, you can't sit there and like hold on to that grudge and that anger about, about, you know, fairly minor things or things that anybody in a bad moment could possibly have done or said, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. stuff like that happens, right? Um, but this kind of really egregious stuff that goes way over the line, you know, mm-hmm. um, there, there is a space where you can, you can both hold compassion and accountability in the same space, you know, yes. and we usually yes. kind of we separate those yes. I think, conceptually in ways that are not really helpful, um, yeah. that that being compassionate and still holding people accountable and not allowing them to do that to you again, mm-hmm. you know, are things that you can you can hold within the same space. And mm-hmm. and I, I think that the, the way that this episode is looking at forgiveness does not have accountability in that space. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't really know how to hold people accountable that, you know, we, we culturally, they're either all evil and all bad, you right. know, and must be and all that kind of stuff. Or we have compassion for them. And we say, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Baby. That's fine. You know, yeah, that we don't have that kind of central, more complicated, dissonant space. Um, and we desperately, I think, need a place in our, um, in our works of our culture, you know, in our art to to create that for people because mm-hmm. it, it feels like it's either forgiveness and everything's okay which it's not or mm-hmm. accountability and you cannot be forgiven which is also not the case yeah you know i'm gonna quote the wisdom of the care bears oh awesome i like it good or bad you're still a person mm-hmm. and that's where we fall off with the forgiveness thing right. because forgiveness mm-hmm. is like oh erase 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 yeah. Never mind. It never happened. Mm-hmm. When what I think what we're trying to do with forgiveness is acknowledge the humanity. We yeah. like acknowledge somebody's humanity. We can do that and still say, no, that was horrible and violent. And you don't pull a gun on someone yeah. you claim to love. Like, no, you don't no. pull a gun on anybody. You, you don't pull a gun, pull a gun on like, anybody because they're not doing what you want them to but do. This, but this fucking narrative about like, oh, if it's real love, yeah. it's going to be you know, violent and Passionate scary at and times. And it's going to be like that yeah. you're going to do these like rash, horrible things that you're going to call mm-hmm. each other names. And no, yeah. no, no. Mm-hmm. And that's something you said um, something about, you know, male entitlement to women's bodies mm-hmm. and experiences, which of course is my like, that's my, my phrase, phrase of my heart. You're speaking my love language right. when we talk about this <laughs> because something we haven't gotten into with mm-hmm. this at all is that um this is a student teacher relationship yeah this is a i mean we've got we've got this power thing going on here and oh yeah and this is gendered as fuck yes yes i mean i mean okay so the the this is all about (laughs) <laughs> this is this is the ghost of some entitled dude mm-hmm. getting Buffy to do his emotional labor for him. Right. I mean, like, no, that's very like, true. Physical and emotional labor. Like I'm going to I I'm <laughs> Yeah. I have, there we could do a whole podcast episode just on the the interesting genderedness of this. Yeah, this episode no, of Buffy. it is interesting. And one of the things, too, that we completely ignore in this episode, because Grace got herself shot, right? And we see her as this victim who was trying to do right. the right thing and breaking it off, is that she had a relationship with this child. Yes. Like, a teacher and a child, that is not, a teacher and student is not okay. It is not okay on so many different yeah. levels. It is not ever okay. Yeah. Um, there is a huge power differential. There is, I mean, it is, it is. I would say like on the level of a parent and a child, like you just don't, that's just a relationship where you don't do that. And I'm not saying that like, you know, if there's a, you know, a TA and a grad or something like that, like if there's people who are very close in age and they're kind of like, and it's after the class is over and they were both adults when they met and it's mm -hmm. later, you know, that's, you know, that's 
different because because relationships can change and evolve after the fact and so yeah. like that's you know like that's not a problem for me mm-hmm. um but but especially when um although I don't think I could ever I don't think I could ever I can't change like that once I've been a, once somebody's been my student that's it like I don't right. think I ever they're see in that role thing. yeah but I can understand how other people can evolve past that space sure. and that's fine you um know. You know, but if he's if he's 18 and she's the 22 year old, they just made a high school teacher. I mean, I can see where like after he's graduated, exactly after he's not the student anymore, after time has passed. That is I think there does need to be some time passing. Yeah. You know, oh for um, sure. That is seriously unethical. Yeah. No, it's it's not even just unethical. It's just it's such an abuse of that relationship. So. He is a victim here, too. Yes. Like, that's wrong. He's a child. She is clearly an adult. Like, that's not okay. But because what he does is so egregious, so over the line, um, we we often kind of skip past that. Like, we don't even get a mention of, ugh, teacher student. Yeah, yeah. You know? Like, well, we don't because... even address that. Well, Lonnie, that's because all teenage boys just want to stick it in every woman they right. come across. And it's okay right? like it's, if it's a uh, woman. It's, it's okay, okay if, if it's a woman, woman and it's a If it's male an older student. woman seducing a younger man, that's right. okay. That's no, not Okay, creepy. and by the way, if you guys aren't reading the sarcasm there, we're both clearly saying that's not okay. It not doesn't okay. make a difference. Not it doesn't okay. make it better. <laughs> yes, it oh, is God. not okay yes. either way. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. just, yeah. yeah, but it's not addressed because it's just kind of like, oh yeah, sure, okay, you know. Yeah. teacher female teacher in love with male student and that's like legit right. somehow because we're not seeing it we're seeing it from the fantasy perspective of the student you know mm-hmm. and a student falling in love with their teacher that happens and i think that that's that completely understandable all the time. it happens Guilty people fall charged. in love with their people fall in love with their <laughs> therapist i had crush i had a crush on my history ta when i was in college he never was inappropriate so it was mm-hmm. fine it is okay for the student to have a crush on the teacher that happens what is not okay is for a, st- a teacher to ever indulge that in any to way act upon it it's the acting upon act it that's upon a problem it, yeah. you can't yeah. i mean People people fall in love with the wrong people all the damn time. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> for all kinds of reasons. And Ooh. you know, and for the person in the position in the like unempowered position, you know, for yeah. the student, for the you know, for them to fall in love with somebody who's in a position of authority, who's like all that, like that's so normal and it happens all the time. Like that is a that is a clear transference. Like it's fine. Like that's a completely normal thing. It's the acting on it. That's the problem. Um, and it, that's a problem for the person who is in the powered position. Like that mm-hmm. is their responsibility to make sure they shut that shit down. Mm-hmm. Um, so so all of that, I think, is, um, you know, is it's it's interesting that we don't address it. I think it's because of the gendered situation that we don't address it. And then to yeah. get back to what you were talking about, though, with that like gendered, you know, a James using Buffy to you, work yeah. out his emotional labor. Right. But yeah. he had been choosing men for that role. It isn't until we get Buffy and Angel specifically that we yeah. gender flip it. And I was yeah. interested in your perspective on on that. Oh, man. Oh man, oh man, oh man. So I I <laughs> So I think lots of things are happening at the same time here. One of mm-hmm. them that just annoys the shit out of me is yes. James, you know, boy ghost James is going to get Slayer girl Buffy to do his work for him. That like that but I also kind of like that there's some he he chooses her because he sees her sadness and her um you know that she is going through a grief process and that and it's yeah. so deep and so profound mm-hmm. that and because she is the slayer and she's got this supernatural element to her i like the idea there's something charming to me about the a ghost being like, oh, I, yes, I resonate with this person mm-hmm. and their yeah. sadness. Like, I, yeah. yes, like I feel <laughs> I'm invisible right. and I feel seen. And I feel like know? that's why he chose her, not necessarily because he needed a woman to do his emotional labor. Although, of course, that yeah. is exactly what happened. Yeah. And, um, but, and that's yeah. what Buffy does. Buffy ends up doing that a lot in her yes. Slayer role. It's just like, yeah. OK, all right. You know. 
the woman is going to swoop in and fix this mess. Right. Um, which I think that, and this is one of those things where it's that raindrop effect, right? It's yep. not that in this particular very specific instance that there's anything really wrong with that because it does resonate yeah. for her. And it is her also working out her own stuff. I mean, she is using his trauma to work out her thing with Angel. And so I think that that Absolutely. and her forgiveness of herself. So I think that that's okay. It's just that we so often see you know, like there's this wonderful moment in uh, Metaphors Be With You, which uh, which Rob Hyrett is uh, doing for uh, for Chipperish Media. Um, Star Wars podcast, fantastic. Metaphors Be With You. Go check it out. It's amazing. Um, but there's this one moment where he's talking about how Leia is comforting Luke uh, after the planet with everybody she knows, her entire family, her home planet um, has just been disintegrated. She's lost everyone, you know, is taking the time to comfort Luke and do his emotional labor mm -hmm. for him. Um, so that is it. And, and Rob has this wonderful reaction to it, which I absolutely love. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where, um, you know, we see that so much women are expected to do the emotional labor and not to have reactions of their own, that they are yeah. there to serve as an emotional midwife for everybody else, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so because we see that so much culturally, when we hit that here, even though there are reasons in this specific story with Buffy that it works, you can have that reaction legitimately like, oh God, here we go again, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what I love is that you know, so Buffy's inside. The Scoobies are at the high school. Buffy's mm -hmm. inside. Everybody's like, oh, shit, what are we going to do? Yeah. And Giles says, there's no man inside for James to possess. Yeah. And it's like, all right, cool. Like, that's like, we're safe here. But of course, that's not what happens. Mm -hmm. And I love this notion that spirits don't have sex or gender or maybe this is a gender thing i don't mm -hmm. i mean if you have questions about gender listen to the podcast gender reveal mm -hmm. it's completely brilliant but i mean there is it doesn't seem to be about what this person's body looks like or what yeah. role they play in society or how they're perceived it's about that sense of understanding mm -hmm. that James has this connection with Buffy because they need to work out their similar, yeah, <laughs> their similar experiences, and I just think that is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. And we're not—I don't know. There's just there's there is something so. I love. First of all, I love it anytime we. I'm going to say gender flip, which sounds like I'm talking about a binary. Gender's not a mm -hmm. binary. It's a spectrum. You you know, yeah. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know this and I know this. And, and in stories, we like to take our masculine and feminine as very binary. And we like to yes. flip flop mm -hmm. them. And I am such a sucker for that, even yeah. when it's terrible. Um, <laughs> but I do. I love this idea that in order for... In order for some sort of closure or resolution to happen in this situation, mm -hmm. that we have to get outside of the, you know, angry, angry boy pointing a mm -hmm. gun at, you know, his his uh, female, you know, paramour. Like that that's. Yeah. I don't know. There's something there's something really, really moving to me mm -hmm. about this doesn't resolve until we change up the the gender roles that we change yeah, up that context who mm -hmm. is who is is whom in this situation and i think that there's something about a deep understanding of mm -hmm. being in another person's position and that it's not about what someone it's not about what someone looks like or what their body parts are. It's about mm -hmm. the emotional experience. Exactly. Um, yeah. Well, and the thing is, is that gender, like we've talked a lot about how religious symbols, you know, in, in Buffy and in, in general, like already come into stories pre-charged, right? Yeah. So that's why you use those symbols because they have the charge already built into them culturally from the way that we interact with those symbols and the way that we use them in our storytelling. Um, and I think that gender also comes into everything already pre-charged, oh, right? Yeah. We already have these ideas about what masculinity is. And we have these very strong ideas about what femininity is. And 
And when we gender flip a story, you know, not just in this specific instance, but just in general, when you gender flip that story, you kind of break out of some of that cement a little bit around the expectations of a gender. And you're able to see this, these human dynamics in a way that have that are kind of genderless in context, right? They kind of mm-hmm. break free of those spaces yeah. and you can see it in a different perspective. Yeah. And I think that that's part of the reason why gender flipping in, in a lot of these things where we have roles that are so charged from the gender associations mm-hmm. um, end up kind of opening up that narrative space in a way that is really interesting. And it feels freeing. Yeah. When you see a gender flip, there is that sense of like, okay, I'm free from these constraints from this charge, Mm -hmm. you know, and I can actually look at this just in the context of what it actually is. Mm -hmm. So I I like that too. Yeah. Yeah. There's not, I mean, I want there to be more there, there. I think you're absolutely Mm -hmm. right that it, it comes about kind of, I mean, it comes about in this great way because we need someone in the role of grace who can stand up and, you know, forgive James yeah. for what he's done and hey isn't it convenient that Angel can do that for <laughs> us um, right. but we also we do get this interesting connection to gender and sex and relationships and I just I love it it's fascinating. It is. It's very, it's very, very cool. Um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and transition us out of this and talk a little bit about um, how we hear at Chipperish Media, unlike Angel and Spike and Drew, cannot just kill somebody and steal their concrete mansion. Right? We can't. <laughs> so we can't do that. <laughs> so we need help from our loyal listeners to keep Angel, Spike, and Drew in the manner to which they've become accustomed, which appears to be living in a literal manner. Uh, Patreon supporters get benefits like exclusive content, such as our Still Chipper podcast, and they get to hang out on the Discord channel and argue with us about all the things they thought we got wrong during the show, which is always fun. Um, Chipperish podcasts have absolutely no advertising. We rely on our patrons to perform all of our exorcisms and make our scapulas, and that adds up after a while so to everyone who is already supporting chipperish on patreon thank you so much you've made it so that we don't have to murder the owner of the frank lloyd wright cement mansion in la and i'm sure that those people really appreciate that and for those of you who have not yet thrown your dollar in the hat go ahead and give it a shot because it is a lot of fun really helps us keep these podcasts going and have conversations like this one. So transitioning out of that, let's go ahead and talk about uh, Angel and Spike and Drew in the Frank Lloyd Wright concrete mansion. Oh my God. <laughs> I it's so love, cool. Isn't it? I love them so much. Yes. I love our vampire triad so, mm-hmm. so much. But oh my God, give it up for Juliet Lando. Like, oh my God. We have dialed I didn't think we could dial up the the crazy with Drusilla. Yeah. But I think we did in this episode. I think No, it's that- it's, it's nuts. The, and the sexy way that she is playing, when Angel is God. like kneeling before her and putting his face on her abdomen <laughs> and you look at her, you cut to her face and I'm like, Is this is he is he doing something to her under yeah. there? Because it seems like right. it seems like something moved. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Well, and <laughs> they're the Angel and Spike are so hostile to each other in their yeah. you know quiet mm-hmm. wordplay sort of way. And Drew is just like she does not care. This is great. She's having no, the time fantastic. of her life after her life. Oh, she is sure. just. She is living it up. I love it. Yeah. I love it so much. But yeah, Angel, Angel being sexy with Drusilla. Yeah. I'm here for it. I'm it's kind of fun. It. And even if he's only doing it to taunt Spike, I still it really is love about, it. <laughs> it really is about Angelus and Spike. And I have to say that um, that I kind of, I'm kind of here for Angelus and Spike and the sexual tension between the two of them. Like, oh, this whole yeah. relationship, Drusilla is just the middleman. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. it is a it is a love hate relationship. And I think that if Angel and Spike just went into a room uh-huh. and made an evening of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it would it would it would it would diffuse a lot of that tension. 
Uh, mm-hmm. which of course we don't want because this is fiction and we want to have as much tension as humanly <laughs> possible. Um, but the two of them have got, like, they've got spark. Like, Drusilla's there and Drusilla's awesome, but Drusilla is so immaterial because Angel and Spike is where all the chemistry is. Yeah. I mean, it is oh, fantastic. For sure. For mm-hmm. sure. And for as, like, as wild and um, kind of feral Drusilla yeah. is, she's not sexual, in the way mm-hmm. that Angel and Spike are, she's mm-hmm. kind of there. I mean, she does. Well, I do think she's the... her sexuality, like her stuff, is all on the surface. Whereas with Angel and Spike, the fact that they deeply, deeply want each other sexually is all subtextual. Oh, for sure, it's all under there. for sure, for sure. But I just mean that, like Drusilla, when yeah. she's like, "I will, I'll sleep naked in the dirt, like the yeah. animals." Like it's just this very like. I'm just wild and free and yes. not so mm-hmm. much like I'm going to turn these boys on and get them to yeah, do exactly. anything I want. Like Drusilla is just along for the ride. Yeah. So mm-hmm. to speak, you know, Drusilla is yes. just like that. I, this is great. Mm-hmm. And it's very, you're right. It's very surface mm-hmm. and it's very like, she's just gonna, she's just gonna live sort of in the moment, but also in her right. weird Drusilla headspace yes. and I just yes. lo- I, oh the glee we get some truly gleeful Drusilla in this episode oh, yeah. and it makes me so happy she is delightful I love Drew in this episode and I love of course that moment at the end with Spike Holy right shit kicks back the chair stands up and is like it's on man like he has been holding back and pretending to still be hurt so that he can mm-hmm. surprise mm-hmm. Angel at the right moment um, and I love, I love, love all it. of that I mean it's you know we have this stuff with uh, with the three of them in the concrete mansion you know which is which is very fun um, they've got the night blooming jasmine out in the courtyard which is something that we recreate uh later in the hyperion over in the angel series so that's Mm -hmm. kind of fun to see that reference um but uh but there really isn't much going on like we don't see we have drusilla having this kind of vision of the slayer in trouble but then angel says well i don't know i think i'm bored with the slayer i want to stay here and be with drew and yet he still ends up at the high school You know, coming in and having this experience with Buffy. Yeah, because he can't not. I think that he can't not. I like the way that that has grown too. that Angel. Angel can't or Angelus doesn't have any control over this pull that he feels. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah. Toward Buffy. And then at the end, when he's washing off the love, he's trying to cleanse himself. (laughs) No. The baptism in the court. I feel so violated. Feel so yeah. violated. Oh when you're, <laughs> you've exfoliated when you start to draw blood. What is <laughs> right. it that's my like, <laughs> Might want to take it easy there. Yeah. And Drusilla, oh God, no, Drusilla is going to make it all better. We're going to find you a nice toddler. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh, my God. I love that. He's like, I need a vile kill. I need kill. a vile kill. <laughs> so funny (laughs) i know i mean they're so great and they're just kind of you know they're kind of treading water at the moment you Mm -hmm. know uh waiting for the final movement of this this angelus story one thing i find interesting though is that spike and drew who mostly have known him as angelus as opposed to angel call him angel yeah isn't that weird it's super weird. Because his identity, we've got yeah. an identity thing here where he is not Angel, he is Angelus, and that is a clear line drawn. And yet the I can see why Buffy would call him Angel. I can see yeah. why all the Scoobies would call him Angel because that's how they knew him. Mm-hmm. But for Spike and Drew, it feels like an oversight in the script writing. That, oh, yeah, they should have called him Angelus, but they don't. Yeah. I don't know. I could see it. I could see it working either way. Mm-hmm. I kind of feel like this is the... This is an extension of the um, Jenny Calendar's headstone says Jenny Calendar and not right, right. You know, this is how Yana we, this is how we know because this character. we yeah. this is how we the audience know this character. Yeah, I think maybe I think maybe that is for the audience, but I don't know. I don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. the audience would figure it out, but. Still. The audience it would is figure weird. it out, absolutely. It is weird. It is a little weird. It is a little weird. And it's one of those things that, like, you know, yeah, it's it's strange. 
But um, but anyway, so I thought that, that was kind of cool. We also have some interesting foreshadowing kind of happening yes. here in this episode. We have this uh, connection to the mayor's office. The first time we mentioned the mayor, yeah. you know, Snyder knows exactly what's going on at the Hellmouth, and he's covering it up. Um, and that moment, you know, the fear in Snyder's face when the guy says, "Perhaps you'd like to take that up with the mayor," and he's like, "No, no, <laughs> you know? nope. Um, I'll handle and it's, it." It's, <laughs> it's funny because this moment doesn't really relate to the rest of the episode or even the rest of the season. I mean, this is season three foreshadowing mm-hmm. that we're putting in here. Um, but it's kind of it's a neat little sort of, uh, you know, pre-planted Easter egg. At the time that people were watching this, it wouldn't have made any sense. And narratively within the episode, it really doesn't belong there. But for those of us who have seen, of course, everything that happens in this show, it's kind of fun to have that reference to the mayor to know that Snyder knows everything that's going on. And of course, we have all the snakes that have manifested um, in this episode. And then knowing that the mayor at the end of season three is going to turn into a giant snake and eat Snyder whole. Um, <laughs> kind of fun. Kind of a yeah. fun little yeah. reference. I don't know if that was a deliberate thing that they already knew at this point that that was going to happen. Um, but it's kind of funny. And then there's this moment where Willow says the only solution is the final solution <laughs> to which Xander responds, nuke the school. I like that. And of course, at the end of season three, they do blow up the school. Yeah. So um, so it's kind of funny that we had like those little little you know easter eggs sort of in there just waiting to be discovered later on uh and that was kind of fun yeah yeah i love that i love snyder's genuine terror about the yes. prospect of having to confront the mayor yes no it's <laughs> so, so we're backed up same thing happened in san diego like he's just exactly. <laughs> Oh, Snyder. No, it's fantastic. Oh, it really is great. It's it's fun to have that there. Even though narratively in this episode it doesn't belong and I would argue against it, I, I'm glad it's there because it's kind of fun. Um, one other thing that we're going to mention, just because if we don't, somebody's going to tweet at us and say, I can't believe you guys didn't notice this. Uh, the version of the song... I Only Have Eyes for You that was used in this episode came out in 1959, which is four years after James and Grace happened. Yep. But whatever. But we have, a, we have a responsibility to call that out because otherwise we will get yelled at all over yep. the interwebs mm-hmm. for, for not mentioning mm-hmm. that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, Noelle, did you have anything for what are you wearing? I don't really. I mean, I love I, I love when we're in Buffy's dream and we've got all the, you know, big crinolines under the big old yeah. skirts but no I didn't I didn't see a lot of significance in the mm-hmm. clothing this week did you pull anything well in in again in this nod to foreshadowing right mm-hmm. you know we have Willow wearing a rainbow sweater <laughs> um and of course Willow becomes not just you know the first gay character really to, aside from Larry the first major character to be gay um you know in Buffy but also like on TV like mm-hmm. the first lesbian relationship I think is is Willow and Tara and I that's one so. of the big things of course that's going to happen in a couple of seasons um but we do have Willow wears rainbow uh, a fair amount and that is of course a symbol of gay pride and so th- something seeing Willow in the rainbow sweater even though I didn't like really actually attach any actual significance to it I don't think that they were trying to hint that like hey Willow's gonna go gay Willow's uh, gay yeah. I don't think that that was the intent there um, mm-hmm. but I, I like it anyway I, it's yeah. just something that gave me this this very tiny sense of delight there's a lot of rainbow in Willow's yeah. wardrobe she's got a backpack yeah. that has rainbow yeah. straps mm-hmm. um, some of that I think is they put her in these outfits that are kind of not childlike, but sort of childish. Yeah, she no, wears they're, they're a lot childish. of a I lot of so. her mm-hmm. a lot of her jewelry. She wears a lot of jewelry, yeah. but it's all like it looks very summer camp and like little girl. Yes. She's got a lot of like plastic bead. Mm-hmm. necklaces and, and she's got like that, that backpack that is the yellow smiley mm-hmm. face you know so mm-hmm. i mean yeah Willow's, and they do her pigtail yeah. braids which i, mm-hmm. I mean delightful delightful yes. delightful we, i don't think we get pigtail braids in this episode but willow yeah. with the braids mm-hmm. oh my god yeah it's um, very sweet they do try to i think i think the rainbow is trying to kind of Mm-hmm. child her down a little bit i mean when she's yes. talking to buffy about love and she says you know love can be nice and that's the word mm-hmm. she comes up with it's just like the yeah. sweetest most innocent I read um mm-hmm. 
but yeah, I it delights me, and I'm always like. Whoa! <laughs> it's very sweet. I, I like, like that. I like yeah. that nod to Willow's true nature. Oh. We get a lot of that. In oh this yeah. So we get her her the beginnings of her Wicca. Yep. Um. You know, we get the rainbow sweater. Um. So all of it is it's, is really really nice. It's lovely. It is. And lovely. I like that. I like that. All right. So we got anything for Arg the patriarchy? Oh, uh, we have some really not great jokes in this episode mm-hmm. that are all. I'm not going to repeat any of them, but they're all yeah. products of that kind of patriarchal. Mm-hmm. bullshit um yes yeah and i mean i really i really can go both ways about james and his relationship to grace and that mm-hmm. but i i see i see the entitlement and the yeah the grossness there the the truly truly toxic masculinity especially yeah. since women who are um victims of violence i mean full mm-hmm. stop are it's it's by and large partners it's relationships yeah. you know so oh like that's that's real scary and yeah well you know i mean that's when things happen to women when women yeah. experience violence it is almost always at the hands of a man that they've mm-hmm. been with and it's not to say that you know that in same-sex relationships we don't see that same kind of violence and possession and entitlement oh, yeah. it does happen absolutely um but but statistically we do have a huge problem with men feeling entitled to women and that happens in circumstances of not just you know not just you know shooting somebody who said no mm-hmm. and having retaliation on on women who say no which of course yep. happens all the time in the workplace that's where sexual harassment suits come from mm-hmm. um but that there is this um you know this sense that like you know men telling women to smile mm-hmm. you know like the the women are expected to smile women are expected to make men feel better or men are going to hurt them or kill them or you know use their power against Against them in a number of different ways, not always resulting in violence, but often having a sense of retaliation because a woman did not behave properly. Uh, that is a big problem, I think, that we have, and it does stem from uh, patriarchy. And I do see hints of that, flavors of that in James's approach to Grace after she's yeah. broken up with him. Uh, so all of that, I think, is something that uh, that we definitely see here. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, and that's no, it's also, not great. But that's also a real thing. I mean, women yeah. get shot because they say yeah. no. Because they say no. And that is, yeah. that is, you know. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it happens. Ghastly. Truly ghastly. It's pretty, pretty terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So the girl power moment of the week. I pulled out uh, Willow oh, as God. Willow. Uh, not the moment of the week, but the girl power like existence of the yes. week because it is all Willow <laughs> in this episode. She is killing it in Jenny's class. Uh, she's figuring out and leading the spell casting as Giles is completely out of commission, obsessed with this being Jenny. Um, and she figures out that Buffy went back to the school after, you know, they had the upsetting conversation at the house. Um, She is completely running the show this week. And so even though we have this sense of Willow as a child, you know, I do see her as also like the adult, the leader, you know, stepping into that position. I love that with Willow. From the moment she, you know, yells at everybody and says, get the hell out of my library. When she (laughs) says to Angel, you're going to live forever. What? You don't have time for coffee? Like everything with Willow, she is. and, And she is so much more powerful than I think she recognizes yeah. um, than, than the people around her even recognize. But everybody acknowledges her authority. When Willow says, yes. do this thing, people <laughs> get to doing that thing. Yeah. Like, without question. It's and I love that about kind Willow. Kind of awesome. She it really, kind of she awesome. really owns it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty good. All, All right. right. So what's your favorite part this week? I love the concept of spirits not having sex or gender that it doesn't matter it doesn't yes. matter that there's not a man inside the building for james to possess because it's not about that yet whoever. idiot yeah. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. i love mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. i love yeah. and i love i love giles's delight about mm-hmm. the prospect of a poltergeist we, yeah oh you know i love i love it whenever giles gets excited about something supernatural yeah, or paranormal. It's, fun. it's so cr- and his mm-hmm. little his, Xander says locker monster and Giles's ears just prick up oh. Loch Ness monster. I know. <laughs> like, <laughs> Giles is 
delightful. I love Giles. I love Giles. He is delightful. What's your favorite part, Lonnie? God, when Buffy becomes James, you know, and we intercut the dialogue with her and Angel and then Grace and James in the past and go through that whole thing. Um, you know, it's, it's a little more, the dialogue is a little more on the nose for Buffy and Angel than it is for Grace and James. It works better with Buffy and Angel, although the don't walk away from me bitch doesn't work in any context ever. It's all bad. Yeah. Um, but it gives Buffy this chance to, you know, kind of release that sense of self blame that happens in abusive relationships where the victim feels like it's their fault. And um, and I think that it was it's just so nicely done. And that whole sequence for me is so powerful. Every time I watch it, I love it. All right, that's it for today. To join in the discussion on Twitter, follow me at Lonnie Diane Rich and Noel at Noel Allowed and use the hashtag still pretty. You can also visit the Chippers forums. Go to chippers.com, click on forum and join in the fun. Or you can keep Chipperish Media going to the tune of a dollar a month or more and gain access to the live chat in Discord, where you can hang out with me and Lonnie and all the Chipperish patrons who have some bad boo on their hands. <laughs> You'll also get access to exclusive patron content like our new podcast, Still Chipper, where the Chipperish hosts go off topic and talk about things and ideas that we find delightful. Visit patreon.com slash chipperish to find out more you can also show your support by giving still pretty a great review on apple podcasts or by telling your friends about the show or by over identifying with a murderous ghost we will be back next time with go fish everyone's favorite no, man the worst episode i will put it as the worst episode in the entire run of buffy we'll see if i still feel that way next week but man <laughs> oh, that's not good it's not good go fish the 20th fish. episode of season two until then we encourage you to to always challenge us when you feel it's appropriate you should never be cowed by authority except of course in this instance when we are clearly right and you are clearly wrong 